Well, go ahead and be seated. Good morning, Grace Way. We're going to be in Luke chapter 5 this morning. If you want to go ahead and find that place, you'll need it in just a moment. You've probably heard the book title, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People, right? And of course, that thought has been expressed in countless discussions and articles and other books and whatnot. Why bad things happen to good people. Now, what I want to do this morning, I want to turn that around. And I want to spend some time discussing why good people do bad things. Why good people do bad things. Now, our passage today is one that is fairly familiar, but quite often misunderstood, or even leaves people sometimes wondering, what in the world does it really mean? Why why is this here? As you've heard me say so many times, when we study the Bible, context is everything. Why is this in the Bible? How does it connect to other things in the context? That's what we want to understand. Now, just a brief reminder, Dr. Luke, medical doctor, is writing this gospel. He is dedicating it to a wealthy patron by the name of Theophilus. And like Luke, both of them have not been raised in the synagogue. Neither one of them is a Jew. This is now decades after Jesus lived, and Theophilus, as a evidently fairly new believer in Jesus, is wondering, like many people were, why is it that now more non-Jews are following the Jewish Messiah than Jews? How did that happen? What, what's going on here? And so Luke has been interviewing the eyewitnesses. He's been assembling all the information. He's putting this together in his gospel in order to answer those questions. Now, in this particular part of the book, chapter 4 and 5, Jesus has been revealing his identity as the Jewish Messiah through the authority of his teaching and confirming that with miracles and healings. He's also choosing his first disciples. In fact, in the very next chapter, chapter 6, we're going to see him officially name 12 of those disciples to be his apostles. So this is still fairly early in the ministry of Jesus. He's been at this now for approximately a year. Now there's a subplot going on here that's really, really important, and you don't want to miss this. These young men, because Jesus is choosing guys in their mid-20s, they're all a bunch of 20-somethings, and the reason for that is Jesus is about 31 at this time. So he is a young man himself. But there is this counterpoint developing because all of a sudden on the scene there in Galilee, because there's so much buzz about Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees have shown up. They were religious, very well-respected leaders of that time. And so they're coming to check it out. I mean, Jesus is so successful, he has to be doing something wrong, right? I mean, that's kind of the way that that we look at it humanly. And so these are people, the scribes and the Pharisees, honestly, with whom we have a lot in common. They're very conservative in the sense that they believe the Scriptures. They're very committed to the authority of Scripture, as we are. They are people who are committed to good, solid biblical values, as we are. And I I say that because sometimes looking back in history, when we talk about the Pharisees, we tend to lump them all into one basket and we think of them as evil people. They they were not. Like any group, there were the good, the bad, and the ugly. Every group can say that. But the vast majority of them are what we would call today good people. Now here's what I want us to think about. Within two years, two and a half years at the most, some of these good church-going people are going to deliver their Messiah up to be crucified on a Roman cross. How in the world does that happen? In fact, we're not going to be very far into the next chapter. Just days from what we're reading about right here, And we're going to see some of these good people begin to plan on how they're going to do away with Jesus. How on earth does something like that happen? And I believe this passage gives us some insight into the real issues that pitted the Pharisees against Jesus. 
And there's some powerful lessons for us here. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Don't think for a moment that I am saying that conservative Christians today are the Pharisees of today. I didn't say that. That's not the point. And if you think it is, either you need to listen better or I need to explain more or perhaps both. All I'm saying is, is that we have a lot in common. There are some significant differences as well. I'm just simply saying that we who are also committed to the authority of Scripture and good values and righteous living and all of that, I think that we are probably susceptible to many of the same temptations and problems that they were as well. I mean, this is stuff that affects the way that we live and the way that we relate to people as followers of Jesus Christ. So let's talk about the setting here and the real issue of contention. There are two questions that the scribes and the Pharisees are going to put to Jesus' disciples. We saw the first last time, and so I'm going to give you just a brief review to be able to keep the full context in mind. Now, remember, the Pharisees and scribes are people of godly reputation. They are students of Scripture. They are committed to all things decent. Most of them are middle-aged or above. These are respectable people established in the community. Jesus is about 31. He's choosing as his disciples a bunch of 20-somethings from a middle-class background with no theological training. Okay, and I just want you to understand that. Do I have somebody here who, say, is mid-20s? Could I borrow you? You don't have to say a word, okay? Yeah, yeah, come on, come on. Thanks, thanks. Very, very good, Garrett. Thank you. And, and, and Mark, would you come here also? Yeah, you with the gray hair. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Can I ask how old you are, Garrett? 24. 24. Okay, perfect, perfect. And, and this is Mark. And Mark, I won't ask you how old you are except to say that it's probably a safe guess that you're on the other side of 40. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Now, I want you to get a, a visual here, okay? Think Pharisees. Okay, right here. Think disciple of Jesus. Can you see a contrast of age and appearance and all of that? Okay, I just wanted you to have that visual. Thanks, guys. That, that's, that's all I needed. What? It was simple. No blood was shed, nothing. I mean, that's just... But I, I think it's important for you to have that visual to understand what's going on because this is going to be a major issue as we work our way through the Gospel of Luke. Just to, as, as, as we, Mark, get older, okay, we tend to have this attitude, ah, you're just a bunch of kids, what do you know? I was not here last week because I was invited to celebrate the 42nd anniversary of the church where I was pastor in San Salvador, El Salvador, when you called me to be your pastor. And uh, that's been a long time ago. You can do the math on that. The church was six years old when we arrived. And so that's been a long, long time ago. Uh, We were in the middle of a civil war. We were growing. It was a time of explosive growth all over the entire country, even in the middle of a civil war. And uh, we were having fun last week. The church now has grown, it's mature, it's sent out workers all over the world. It's just a a wonderful, wonderful thing to see the fruit. And they've started, I don't know how many other churches all over their own country and other places. It, it It was great to be back and to rejoice and all that. But we were reminiscing. And we remembered that at the time when I was serving there, there were five or six of us on the pastoral team. And there were people in the church of all ages from, uh, young people, kids all the way up into the seventies and eighties and beyond. But at that time, the pastoral team had a median age of about 25. The leadership, the pastoral leadership of the church had a median age of right at 25 years old. And we were sending out missionaries in the middle of a civil war because we didn't know you couldn't. We were ignorant. I'm I'm being very honest. We, we were so young and ignorant and filled with faith, we didn't know you couldn't do it. Now, for reasons that I think we're going to see today, Jesus said, those are the type of ignorant people that I want to follow me. Because I'm here to change the world. Now, 
stay with me because this is, this is very important. It's a very real and powerful dynamic. So now the first issue, we saw it last week, look in verse 30, but their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Jesus has just called Levi, also known as Matthew, yeah, the guy who wrote the first gospel, he was a publican, a tax collector, despised, hated. Matthew, Levi, did not call Jesus. Jesus called him, said, come, follow me. And now Matthew has made this big banquet in his house, and tax collectors didn't have any other friends except tax collectors, so here's a whole house full of lowlife. And Jesus and his disciples are there eating and drinking with them. And the Pharisees and the scribes show up, and they are upset because publicans like Levi were not the good people, they were the bad people. They were despised. In fact, if we go back to the history of the first century and see some of the things that were written about them by their own Jewish uh, friends and, and neighbors are just absolutely amazing. They were called prostitutes. They were called, they, they were called traitors. They were called thieves they were called beast in human shapes they would be associated with low life and last time we tried to imagine the worst social scum that we possibly could that would be the equivalent of a publican or a tax collector at that time but don't just think low life on the street think low life in general because Levi was quite wealthy, and so you might want to include in your visual image some of the guys who took down Enron, some of the Wall Street and investment banker crowd that have used unethical practices in order to enrich themselves and hurt others, okay? So don't just limit this to street scum, just look for social scum in general, and you've got an idea of the image of a publican or a tax collector in the first century, because here's the deal, the real issue is not rich or poor, it's not old or young, the real issue is spiritual maturity. And the truth is, there are a lot of biblical Hebrews, heroes who were wealthy and influential. And they used their resources and their influence in order to reach people like Levi. Okay, so this is not an indictment of the rich. It's not an indictment of the poor, old or young. It's just simply to say that Jesus comes to shake things up. Now, the Pharisees, in their worldview, saw the home as a sacred place. They saw it as an extension of the temple. And according to the way that they have been raised all of their lives, cut them some slack, they don't know anything else. All of their lives, they have been raised to think that to share that sacred space with sinners would violate its sanctity and it would be condoning the sins of the sinners. Okay, can you understand that? There's people that believe that today. Oh, I can't, I can't invite someone to my house because people would think that I'm condoning his or her sin. And we too tend to be motivated by things like that. This becomes a huge issue because as you know, Jesus is going to become known as a friend of sinners. And that's going to be one of the strongest accusations hurled at him. Jesus is a friend of sinners. He eats and drinks with sinners. And they thought this was a huge issue, and it was to them. According to their worldview, they, they just couldn't understand that. To invite someone into their home or to go into someone's home was a huge issue. To eat in someone's home in this culture is an invitation to friendship, and it's very extremely serious. And so you can just imagine. A publican of all people invites Jesus and his disciples, and they go. Now, of course, what you don't hear about is the fact that the Pharisees and the scribes showed up too. A little hypocrisy going on. You know, we still wrestle with stuff like this, don't we? In fact, I got, I got a great email not long ago from a guy here at Graceway, good guy, loving the Luke study, saying, man, this is so good, I'm learning so much. And he says, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to understand this whole thing, but there's this guy at work, and he is just so radical, like the Pharisees, that I, I don't even know how to handle it, because we, we were talking the other day, and he said, you know what? He says, when I go to a Royals game, I won't even touch a, a cup of beer to pass it down the road. You all been to Royals game, Chiefs game, right? You're sitting there, somebody in the middle orders a beer, and the guy's on the, on, on the aisle, he can't 
literally walk across your lap to deliver the beer. So he passes the beer down the road. Everybody passes the beer down until he gets to the guy who, who ordered the beer. Well, this guy will not do that. He refuses to do that because he is fearful that in one instant of time, if somebody sees him with his hand on that cup of beer, that he is condoning the sin. And he quotes scripture, of course, to verify that. First Thessalonians chapter 5 says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Well, that's serious because I, I, I believe that. I believe that that's true. But here's the problem. We sometimes don't understand English very well. The problem is not with the Bible. The problem is with our understanding. And that's not what that verse says. It says abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, in the English language, correct me, teachers, if I'm wrong, but the word appearance has a number of different meanings, and it doesn't mean just similitude it doesn't mean just semblance in, as in giving the appearance of something it can also mean something appears there it is okay the greek word that is used here never means semblance as in giving the appearance of something because if that were the meaning then jesus is guilty jesus is in the home of a publican eating and drinking with sinners so if that means don't give the appearance of evil then he's dead guilty but that's not what it means the word means form or kind in other words whenever evil appears in any form or kind don't participate in it now that makes sense that's what scripture says but we've heard the other so many times that it becomes part of our worldview and then we start tacking on crazy rules and where do we draw the line and this and that and, and the other and, and pretty soon we've got the same type of complicated system that the Pharisees had. We saw Jesus answer last time that it has to do with his mission. Why am I here? Because that's why I came. I came to bring healing to sinners by calling them to repentance. Without apology, Jesus is a friend of sinners despite how that might affect his testimony. He just is. That's what Jesus is about. He's here to work with those who are sick and hurting and need a savior. And to do that, you gotta make contact. Because most of them are not going to show up at church on Sunday morning. They didn't back then. And they don't now. Now here's question number two. It has to do with fasting. Verse 33. Let's pick it up in verse 30. But the scribes, Pharisees murmured against the disciples, saying, Why do you eat with publicans, drink, eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Jesus answering, said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink? And this is the second question. This is as far as we had gotten last time. He said unto them, Can you make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. Now, put this in context for you. The Pharisees were very pleased that they had the pretty fixed custom of praying for the nation of Israel and fasting two days every week on Mondays and Thursdays. They've been doing this for a long long time this is part of who they were so every if you're a Pharisee every Monday and Thursday you prayed and fasted on that day for the nation of Israel good thing to do there's nothing wrong with that but what had happened is over time they had developed the tendency to focus more on the practice of fasting rather than the purpose of what they were doing you hear me you know what I'm talking about here they lost sight of why they were doing it. They lost sight of the purpose. They started to focus on the practice itself. And we have that same tendency, quite honest, don't we? I mean, if a meal is so good and important, then if I give it up, I'm being really spiritual, and God has to be pleased with that, and therefore he'll give me what I want, right? No, you just blew through a whole bunch of biblical truth. You ever think like that, though? I think we all do from time to time. Well, if this is really good, then if I give that up, then God's going to be pleased, then he'll give me what I need. No, God doesn't do deals. God is, well, God. He doesn't do deals. Okay, but we, boy, we get this mentality. 
So Jesus then responds here in verses, thir- th- verses 34 and 35 by giving them this illustration of a wedding celebration. Now, by the way, he's not tossing out fasting, is he? He's not doing away with fasting. There is a time to fast, and there's a proper reason for doing so. There's a proper way to do so. In fact, Isaiah ch- chapter 55, 58, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 58 goes into some detail about that if you're interested. Now, we're not here this morning to talk about the purpose of fasting. We want to learn about Jesus. But here's the standard interpretation of what Jesus says here in verses 34 and 35. Jesus is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. We learned that in Ephesians 5 and Revelation chapter 19. So while the bridegroom is present, is not the time to fast, but the church will fast after his death and resurrection, right? We've all heard that. We've all said that. Here's the problem with it. Those verses will not be written for several decades yet. They don't understand that. I mean, is Jesus giving them some mystery to figure out? Is that that what he's doing here? He's coded this so that, no, I I think that Jesus is, and and by the way, the illustration is is, is great. And and by the way, the Old Testament does represent the image of Jehovah God as being married to Israel. And there are passages like Isaiah 54, for example, that presents the Messiah as, as being a bridegroom. And I think what Jesus is really saying here is, look, I've been telling you, I am the Messiah. And the children of the bride chamber, these my disciples, and and the Messiah is here. This is a time of celebration, not a time of mourning. I mean, don't make it more complicated than what it is. The symbolism is great. But you know what we do like the Pharisees? We become so involved in the symbolism and the deeper meaning, we forget the meaning that is the most important right there in front of us. And so we develop all this wonderful information. We just never allow the information to change our lives. So don't get too complicated. Jesus is simply saying, hey, I'm the Messiah. I'm here. It's time to celebrate. Isn't that what we're doing now with Christmas? I mean, wouldn't it be a bummer if Christmas time was a time to put on a long face and be sad and fast? Jesus came to earth. Let's all be sad. Let's all fast so that God can know that we're miserable. He'll be pleased with that. I mean, this is not hard to figure out. But we get all these nutty ideas in our mind because we begin to get away from what the point is. So Jesus gives them then a parable with two illustrations beginning in verse 36. He spoke also a parable unto them. No man puts a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new makes it rent or torn, and the piece that was taken out of the new agrees not with the old. And no man puts new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put in new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also, having drunk old wine straightway, or immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. Now, interesting. This is said to be a parable, one parable, but there's two illustrations. So it's one parable, two illustrations to make the same point. And the point, again, very straightforward and simple, the incompatibility of old and new. It's the obvious surface meaning, and it is true. But I think there's a deeper implied meaning that is also true and perfectly fits the context. I'll talk to you about that in just a second. But first, the obvious, old and new don't mix. Now, interestingly enough, in the Greek language, there are two words used here that are translated correctly as new, but we don't have a way to distinguish this in English. One word in Greek means new in nature or kind, as in putting a new patch on an old piece of clothing. It's this this new patch is of a new kind of cloth, a new kind of material. And then the other word that is used means new in time, chronologically, as a new wine. It hasn't been around a long time. An old wine that has been around a long time. And so both words are in play, new in nature and new in time. And I'll tell you in a minute why that is important for us to point out. Now, the bottles that Jesus talks about are not bottles like you and I would think of today, made of plastic or glass or crystal. These bottles in the first century are made of skin of animals. Sometimes they're called wine skins. They would usually be made of goat skin, as a matter of fact. Now, most of us have not grown up, some of you may have, but most of us have not grown up cont- with liquid being in containers made of animal skin. But what happens is, in time, those skins become brittle. 
And so what Jesus is saying, when you have a wineskin that is filled with wine and it's been there until the wine has aged and you use the wine and you've still got the wineskin left, don't do what my wife would do because she's very frugal and very practical. She would think, well, let's be green, let's recycle, let's, uh, let's take this old wineskin and we'll put new wine in the wineskin until it's ready to drink. Okay, don't do that. That's what Jesus is saying. Because what happens when you take that old, brittle wineskin and you put the new wine in it, then during the fermentation process, you've got a lot of activity going on there. That new wine is going to burst the animal skin, and then you're going to have wine all over the place. Okay, it's not too hard to figure out what's going on here. This is the illustration that Jesus is giving. If you're going to have new wine, you have to put in a new wineskin. The old wine goes in old wineskins. The new wine goes in new wineskins. You can't mix the two together. You can't, put, you can't put a new patch on an old garment because the first time you watch it, wash it, the new patch is going to shrink and is going to tear the old garment. So not only have you messed up the new garment by cutting a piece out of it, you're going to mess up the old garment because you put a new patch on it and it's going to tear. You can't mix old and new. Here's, here's a very simple lesson. Jesus is not a patch for your problems. Jesus is God Almighty. He came to give his life for you, that you might have life, that you might be his follower, that you might turn from your sin, and be forgiven and be transformed. Jesus came not to fix what was wrong with the law. Jesus came not to put a patch on the law or an add-on. Jesus came to make all things new. And if that phrase sounds familiar, it's because it comes from the Bible. Jesus came to make all things new. Now, again, just as Jesus does not toss out fasting, he's not tossing out the law, he's not here to destroy Hebrew culture. Listen, Jesus came, here's some more Bible, to fulfill the law. But now that he has fulfilled the picture of the law, the New Testament very clearly teaches we are no longer under the law. We are no longer slaves to the law. Many of the moral principles of the law have been repeated in the New Testament. We live by those principles and those truths. But we no longer observe the Jewish holidays and the feast and, and, and the sacrifices and all that because all of that was fulfilled in Jesus who has made all things new. And if you see the gospel as merely a patch for the old or an extension of the old, it will destroy both old and new. Or as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.27, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, all things, old things are passed away, all things are become new. Old things passed away, all things new. That's what the Bible teaches. Old things done, new things all, all things are new. Now there's some wonderful lessons I think we can learn from all of this about why good people do bad things. Number one, they forget why they're good. They become good so they're, they're, they're walking around strutting and thinking, hey, hey look at me, man, I, I'm good, I'm good. And they think that they're good because of what they did or perhaps many times what they don't do. I don't do this, I don't do that, therefore I'm good. They forget that we are all bad and none of us is good except for the grace of God. And that's where our life comes from. God blesses us in order to be a blessing to those who need him. Not just so that we can sit around and talk about how good we are. Are you more interested with everybody knowing that you are good? Or are you more interested that people understand why God's grace has made you something new that you weren't before? Sometimes we're so comfortable in being good that we don't see any need to repent. We think repentance is a one time for all thing that we did the day that we put our faith in Jesus Christ. We don't realize the Bible continues talking about growing and changing and repenting as long as we are drawing breath on this planet because we are constantly growing. 
Yes, our life is something that begins with a point of time decision, but it begins a process, a process. The Pharisees had become so comfortable in being good, they saw no need to repent when the Messiah came. And here's the point. Why did Jesus pick a bunch of 20-somethings? Because the older people who knew the Scripture better, who had all the theological training, were people that had stopped evaluating themselves honestly, were unwilling to change. And Jesus knew that people who are unwilling to change will never be able to change others. People who are unwilling to change will never be used to change others. So Jesus says, I'm starting with a bunch of 20-somethings that don't know any better. And they went out and changed the world. Second lesson is how the Pharisees saw self-denial and suffering as a way to please God. Look at me, I'm fasting, I'm pleasing God, he's got to be happy with me. I fasted two days, next week I'm going to do three days, then God will really be happy with me. Then I'll really get what I want. We think of God like he's Santa Claus. Isn't that weird? You're going to find out who's been naughty and nice. He's keeping a list. He's checking it twice. Instead of seeing self-denial and suffering as something that God promises us as part of the growth process, And how God uses the natural suffering in this world that has been twisted by sin in order to grow us up and to continually. Here's the great thing. We can continually be new wineskins. We can continually be fresh if we continually are open to grow. Third lesson, they were focused on external principles or practices, rather, instead of internal truth and principles. They had a whole list of rules about meals and fasting, and they they focused on maintaining their, their purity and their testimony, but they forgot the purpose of meals, which was to make friends and establish relationships. And they forgot the purpose of fasting, which was to cry out to God in times of hurt, in times of suffering that we might learn and grow and be transformed through that time of suffering. It's kind of like today, we make church into a place you go, a place you attend, and we come looking for what I can get instead of looking to be transformed into what God wants me to be. Here's another lesson. They, They turn celebration into mourning and mourning into celebration. I mean, isn't that crazy like we talked about before? They they should be celebrating the arrival of the Messiah, but they're wanting to sit around and mourn and be sad and grim-faced. We're celebrating the arrival of Messiah too, 2,000 years later, and we're happy about it. At least, I hope you are. I hope you're not a Grinch. Well, you know, Christmas is not really in the Bible. I don't know, the 25th of December, and those trees things are something about them in Jeremiah, blah, 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 blah. Get a life. I mean, forget about all that stuff. Jesus came to be one of us. He died on the cross and rose again. We can have life. Let's celebrate. Let's be happy. But instead, they they saw their self-denial as a badge of honor. They just totally reversed what God wanted to do. Their focus, another lesson, is to keep comfortable in what they knew instead of growing into what was radically better. And that's where verse 39 comes in. Verse 39 is really hard to understand if if you just take it by itself. No man also having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. Now, that's if if you're a wine drinker, that's that's standard operating procedure. You look for the older stuff that's matured and, you know, the tannins have softened and all that type of stuff. And you're thinking, okay, yeah, why do I want to try the new stuff? Jesus said, you try the stuff that I'm giving to you, you'll never be satisfied with the old again. But the problem was they were so comfortable with the old, they wouldn't even try the new. This is not the way it's always been. No, it's not, Jesus was saying. It's not. This is radical. This is unexpected. But here's the danger, y'all. Here's the connection, I believe, with the rest of the passage. Here's the danger. These old wineskins, they are the Pharisees and the scribes. This is the warning from Jesus. You want to know why I picked a bunch of 20-somethings to follow me? Because you guys, instead of growing, 
have allowed yourselves to become brittle and stagnant. I've come to pour out transformation and blessing upon my creation. And if you got a taste of this, it would destroy you because you are so brittle. You would burst right open because you stopped growing a long time ago. What a powerful statement. Your focus is on preserving the old ways and your traditions and the way things used to be in the good old days. People who have been in the faith for many decades, by the way, have a tremendously important place in the body of Christ. We need you, and I include me in that, because we're the ones to put the lives down that are to be models and patterns. We're to be the mentors and the guides. We need people with decades of experience walking with Jesus, but we need people who have stayed fresh. We need people who understood that I always could be a new wineskin because I can always be in the process of being transformed and changed. This is not a been there, done that, got the t-shirt type of deal. It is a process that lasts for a lifetime. I can always be the newness of life because I'm going to put on the new man that is in Christ and I put off the old man that was riddled with sin. I don't have to allow myself to become old and brittle. That's what Jesus is saying. Well, we just don't teach the Bible like we ought to. No, 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 you do this and that, blah, 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 blah. You know, my experience has been those types of comments come from people who have stopped growing a long time ago. And sometimes I'll hear statements like that. I'll just say, hey, do you realize that we have more opportunities to study the Bible right now at Grace Way than we ever have? Because they just don't know. They just don't know. And they've not taken advantage of those opportunities because they don't see their need to grow because they're satisfied with the way they are. And Jesus said, if I wanted to pour out my power upon you, you couldn't handle it you would split right down the middle and you would spill your guts all over everybody because you're brittle you're hard you know guys we're, we're overloaded with change right now i mean no question about it change in high school ministry change in middle school ministry change in facility changes from sunday school classes to small groups all that type of stuff god is moving you're going to be an old wine skin or a new will we make some mistakes yes always make mistakes it's how we grow it's how we learn growing 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 how do we do it in El Salvador in our 20s we made a lot of mistakes in the process of changing the world did the disciples of Jesus make mistakes oh my word did they ever Three and a half years with Jesus, they arrive at the hour of the hours, the final exam. They all turn and run. Jesus said, okay, great, you guys just passed. <laughs> You've learned you can't trust in yourself. You're going to have to trust in me. Either we end up stagnant and comfortable and judgmental, or we will grow like the disciples. We may not understand everything. We'll make mistakes. But like the disciples, we can be continuing to grow. We have some amazing saints of God in this church who have known Jesus for years, and we praise God for their example and for their growth and all of this. Oh, by the way, uh, who's leading this charge of all this change going on? Me. I'm in my mid-60s. So don't talk to me about getting brittle. Well, just not the way we used to do that. Okay, 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 I get it. If God wanted to pour out his power on you, could you handle it? Can you be stretched? You know what happens when you get brittle? You try to stretch something brittle, it's going to crack and break. I want to be like Paul who wrote to the Philippians at the end of his life when he knew he was going to die soon. And he said, hey, brothers, I don't pretend like I've made it already. I just want to know Jesus more. He's about ready to die. He wants to know Jesus more. Until his dying breath, he wants to grow. Me too. Maybe what you need is a new worldview. Maybe you need to know God. And if we can help you in any way, we we'll always talk about this. Take this little card, fill it out, circle the C. It means I want to know how to connect with God. Give it to somebody at the VIG counter as you leave today. 
We'll contact you say, hey, what can we do to talk? How can we get together? How can we show you that Jesus wants you to follow him? He wants you to be part of his effort to change the world by changing lives one at a time. What an amazing opportunity. So where can I sign up for that? We'll talk about it. Jesus is calling you. It has nothing to do with how old or how young you are. It has to do with how flexible you are and how much you want to grow, how much you want to have all things new, or how much you want to sit around and talk about the way things used to be. Jesus is looking for 20-somethings. I'm not a, I've been a long time since I've been a 20-something, but I want to act like one. <laughs> I want to be flexible as one because I want to follow Jesus. Dear God, in Jesus' name.